Good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to have you here today. I saw Karen and Terry and Randy. Hello, it's wonderful to have you here with us. It's a beautiful spring day here. Uh, probably will get up in the mid-70s today, which I'm very grateful for. You're not going to see me mowing lawns today. I'm going to wait till Friday when the lawns have dried out sufficient, sufficiently so they don't plug up the mower. I love this time of year, getting outside, mowing lawns, just enjoying the backyard. We have a table and a chairs and umbrella set up, and it's wonderful to go out there and sit, which I haven't had much of a chance to do yet, but because of the rain. Appreciate the rain, though, too. It's what keeps everything green, at least here in Washington State. So I hope you're all doing well. You're resting well. I always wonder what God is doing in our midst through this. What is he doing in our church? What is, what is he teaching us about the nature of being the church? What is he doing in and through the world or in the world through this pandemic right now? I have my thoughts, but my thoughts are in his thoughts and my ways certainly aren't his ways. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so are his ways and his, his thoughts above our thoughts. And so today in the quiet of these moments, may our thoughts and minds settle again on, on Jesus Christ. May we get him back into focus in our life. Let's begin with prayer. Kind and gracious Father, I glance at the CDC site today and they have us at 99,000 deaths and 1.6 million people down with this virus who, who, who have been tested for it. We know that number is a lot higher This is a storm, Lord. In my 60 years, I've never seen anything like it. And in my mother's 95 years, she has never seen anything like it. Father, you're the one who speaks peace into storms. And the disciples were in the boat and a great storm came up on the Sea of Galilee. Your son Jesus was asleep on a cushion, tired and weary from a long day. Tired and weary from a long day of ministering and loving and being your hands and feet and voice and body. And the disciples, terrified with fear, called out, Jesus, don't you care about us? And Jesus awoke, look around, looked around him, and simply spoke to the storm, peace, be still. And the storm ceased. And the waters grew still. But Father, in our lives, the storms still rage. Not just the storm of the pandemic, but the storms of life. You told us that we'd have trouble in this world, tribulation in this world. And don't we know it? Many of us are in that wine press of life where everything is pressing down on us. Some of us have been struggling with finances. Some of us have lost jobs. Some of us are struggling with severe illnesses. Some of us are, have been struggling with shattering relationships or shattered relationships, Lord. The 
the storms of life just keep seem to they just keep rolling into our lives And so, Father, our first request is that you would speak peace to the storm of the pandemic and that you would speak peace to the storms in our life, all those other storms. But at the same time, we know that sometimes you allow the storms in our life, sometimes you send the storms in our life, And so before you answer that first prayer of ours, peace be still to the storm, we pray that you would finish all the work and everything intended by allow allowing this storm of the pandemic in our lives and in the world's lives. Teach us to be wholly dependent on you, to fully lean into you, to put all of our weight over onto the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. To teach us to live in the power of that grace. We pray that you would teach us to walk in the Spirit and to be led of the Spirit. And remind, remind us to ask to be continually filled with the Spirit. Thank you for the empowerment of the Spirit. Thank you for the fruit of the Spirit. Even patience is part of the fruit of the Spirit. We need that fruit today, Lord. And there's a lot of people getting really impatient in so many ways. Impatient with not being, being able to go back to work. Impatient with not being able to open up churches. Impatient with others who don't seem to want to abide by the stay-at-home orders. There's all kinds and all brands of impatience right now. But within the body of Christ, we pray that you would pour out your spirit upon us and that we might acquiesce, surrender to you in such a way and be led, of, led by your spirit and walk in your spirit so that the fruit of your spirit, love, peace, patience, joy, goodness, they might flourish in our lives that we might hunker down for the long haul while having the readiness to start up tomorrow. Again, I pray for your wisdom, for your knowledge, for your discernment in the midst of this storm to know what's the right course, to know what's the right course on getting back out into the community especially for those of us who are at high risk. You would let us know for our churches when the appropriate time is to open them, when the safe time to open them is. As far as the buildings, we're still open. We've been open all along. But also when is the appropriate time for us to start attending church again if we are at high risk. So Father, we pray for your wisdom, your spiritual wisdom, and discernment and understanding. And we pray for unity and agreement in our families, in our church, in our churches. Father, we pray for unity of the Spirit and for that bond of love be between each one of us. Thank you that you have so loved us. And so today, my prayer is finish your good work, Lord. Finish your good work. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks again if you've uh, joined me just since I started praying. It's wonderful to have you here today. Today we're looking at uh, Psalm 29. Again, it's a Psalm of David. I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible. This Psalm is a very old Psalm, and I'll get into that, but it has several headings. Some Sometimes the heading or the title of it is Hymn to the Lord of the Storm. It's also called the Canticle of the Seven Thunders. It's called God's Majesty in the Storm. It's called the Voice of the Lord in the Storm, and it has many more headings. You can just take a look at your Bibles and look right above the psalm and see what heading it's given. 
And so you see in all of those that it's about a storm. So let's read it and then we'll work through it together. Psalm 29, a Psalm of David. Ascribe to the Lord, O sons of the mighty. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in holy array. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks cedars. Yes, the Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf, and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord hews out flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer to calve and strips the forest bare, and in his temple everything says glory. The Lord sat as king at the flood. Yes, the Lord sits as king forever. The Lord will give strength to his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. And so we get to being able to work through this now. Again, it's a Psalm of David. Many think that it's a much older Psalm. Scholars believe that this is the oldest Psalm, psalm we have in our, our uh, Psalm or hymn book, the, the Psalms. What they think happened was David took a, an old Psalm or an old song and then used that to write to write this piece of poetry. We don't know exactly, but it seems to be mirroring some of the, the hymns of the Canaanite gods. And so it would appear that the Israelites, over and against the worship of the Baals, the bowl gods, the storm god, that they wrote this kind of in a play against them to say, Yahweh is the real God who is over the storm, who speaks to the storm, who controls the storm. Again, it's called Hymn to the Lord of the Storm, the Canticle, which is a song of the seven thunders, and we'll see why it's seven. God's majesty in the storm, the voice of the Lord in the storm. So what the psalmist has done, what David has done, whether he's drawn on other sources or whether he's penned this himself, when they lived, were living in Israel, there would be storms that would roll in off the Mediterranean. Thunderstorms, great thunderstorms that would cover the entire land of Israel with these thunderstorms that would rock the mountains. I remember being in Chicago where they have those kinds of thunderstorms roll over. And one day we were in our apartment when one, one of those enormous thunderstorms rolled over. And it was just cracking and rocking the building everywhere. And I went out on the back balcony we were on the second floor and I looked up and right then a bolt of lightning struck right in that, right overhead. It didn't hit me or any, or the building, but it, you could see it and there was no lapse immediately this thunder and it literally shook the building and the stairwell I was standing on. It's that kind of storm they're talking about, these great thunderstorms of the Midwest. I wonder if you have them in Nevada, Terry and Randy. We hardly ever have them here. There's supposed to be one coming on Saturday, so we'll see. Unplug your computers. I've had a computer turn into a toaster in a thunderstorm, which isn't a good thing. You'll also notice that I'm going to be looking at this from the NIV instead of the New American Standard Bible because there's a variant in how people translate one of these verses. It's verse 29. 
And I'll read it first from the NASB. It says, The voice of the Lord makes the deer to calve and strips the forest bare. And, is, and in his temple, everything says glory. And so there's this phrase, makes the deer to calve. And the idea there is animals, sheep, cattle, and even deer out, out in the wild. In thunderstorms, sometimes it causes the, the does to calve. They give birth to their fawns out of fear. And so there's that reading of it, and strips the forest bare. And so we still know that this is a reaction to the storm. The storm, the lightning strips the forest bare. It can cause forest fires. It can also cause the deer to, to calve. But there's another re reading of it, which it's because we don't have a dictionary for the Hebrew language. So some words, we have to discern what they mean by the context and by other sources. By looking at other sources and so on. So another reading of this, the voice of the Lord twists the oaks. When we were camping at Lake Wenatchee one year, we had gotten there just after, a day and a half after, I think it was the next day, after a, a huge thunderstorm had rolled over the lake and rolled over the campground. And there was a very large it was a pine tree. I don't think it was a cedar. It was a, either a pine or a hemlock. But the lightning had struck it and it had, like taking a chainsaw and putting the tip of it into the bark, it had cut a, a spiral gouge into the tree all the way down. It eventually killed the tree. They had to take it down. The next year it was dead. The next year it was gone. When we got there, a family, we saw them. They were it had poured all night and they had a new tent which didn't work so they were soaked they were, had been sleeping in water all night their sleeping bags were soaked they took all of that camping gear all brand new gear they it was first year camping their lawn chairs everything and they threw it in the dumpster got in the car and drove off i felt bad for them because they miss out on the wonder of camping i love camping but that was the year when we had that enormous thunderstorm roll over so I'm going to go with the NIV because it fits the what I'm going to do with this. And again, we have another chiasmus, this stair-stepping into the center of the psalm and then stair-stepping out of it. I like that image of climbing stairs to the most important part or the Im most important verse and then climbing back out of it, going down a very similar set of, set of steps, but only a different set of steps, meaning that the language isn't always the same and so on. So let's take a look at the chiasmus. Suddenly I get relegated to this little box here, which is, that's okay. But, so if you'll notice, this chiasmus has A, B, C, D, E, and then the pairs, E2, D2, C2, B2, A2, climbing back out of the psalm. And they did this in oral cultures so that you would hear it going in and you would hear it going out. It was a way of being emphatic and, and letting people hear when you're reading a book, you can turn back and reread a page. Sometimes I reread re the same page 10 times. You know those kinds of books, especially in school. They didn't have the opportunity to go back, and so they would go back for people so they could hear it twice. But it was always that centerpiece. So here it's F. That is the centerpiece of the psalm. So now let's take a look at this psalm. I'm going to darken it up a little bit so you can read it a little bit better. It says... Um, and you'll notice that it's not really balanced in, in the number of words in each section. They didn't have a need to be OCD about this. It bothers me a little bit because I'm extremely OCD, but they didn't have that need. And we're going to show you, I'm going to show you a couple facets, interesting facets about this psalm that if you just read through it like I did the first time, you don't notice it. And so let's begin. If I look at that first A1, and then down at the bottom, A2, you've noticed I've, I've left it in bold. It says, ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. And so we're talking about angelic hosts, the, the choirs of heaven, if you will. Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory to his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. So David is giving angelic beings instructions to worship the Lord. And then he's going to, along with the congregation of Israel, join in in that angelic singing. 
Have you ever thought about that on a Sunday when we sing that the chorus of angels is singing with us? And that word a scribe is a strange word because it, it sounds like give to the Lord glory and strength. Well, he already has all glory. He already has all strength. So the word doesn't mean give to the Lord. It means recognize that the Lord has glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength means to come to know the glory and strength that is already already his. And the whole psalm now is about his glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. And his name here is Yahweh. Again, we have L-O-R-D in capital letters. And so we know that as Hebrew people would come upon this most holy and revered name of God, Yahweh, they would not read it for fear of of taking it uh, in vain. And so they would read the Hebrew word for Lord, Adonai, over this. And so it became customary to read Lord instead of Yahweh. But it's his most holy name. And we know from later on, we won't go into all that, but Jesus comes on the scene. We're coming up in the story of the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. And it's amazing. We'll get there this Sunday, but it's amazing because she is the first person, this outcast in her own society, uh, by Hebrew perspective and understanding, a, a half-breed Jew who had intermarried the Canaanites and worshipped their gods before finally coming up with this cultic worship. And yet it's to her that he has to go, he needs to go, in order to tell her that he's the Messiah. And when he says it, she says, we know that the Messiah come, is coming. And he says, I am. Not I am he. He just says, I am. And it's, I think it's the first place, I'll have to check on that. But I think it's the first place where he declares, I am, to this social outcast, to this ethnic outcast. And that's the name, that's the verbal form, we believe, of this name. They're tied together in Exodus chapter 3. You can read that on your own if you want. And so we know that this too is Jesus. Ascribe to Jesus, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to Jesus glory and strength. Recognize the glory and strength of our Lord Jesus. Ascribe to Jesus the glory due his name. When you hear the name of Yahweh, when you hear the name of Jesus, we often think of comfort and words like, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. But we often don't think of Jesus in terms of thunderstorms or of lightning or of thunderstorms that are so large it shakes the mountains. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Worship Jesus in the splendor of his holiness. And then if you go down to the bottom and look at the pair, the pairing, the parallelism, the Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. So in the top sec section, we ascribe to the Lord. We recognize his glory and strength. We recognize the glory of his name. We worship the splendor of his holiness. And in response to his glory and strength now, we realize that he doesn't keep that to himself. He gives us his strength to his people, which in the context would be the Hebrew people. But in our context, it's everyone grafted in both the true vine and those who are we Gentiles who've been grafted into the true vine. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. Is today a day when you need strength from the Lord? Is today a day when you need peace from the Lord? What the chiasmus is getting at is the road into that strength and peace is to recognize God's glory and strength, that he is sovereign, that he is in control. Of course, we can always ask for it. Father, strengthen us today. Give us your peace, that peace that we cannot manufacture, that understanding, surpassing peace of Christ. And then we move on to the B1 and B2 in the Psalm, stepping up the stairs. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. 
And then below, the Lord since enthroned on the, over the flood. And so you see water and flood, the, the contrast. The Lord is enthroned as king forever. And so what it's getting at is there is multiple layers of poetic meaning to this. The Lord is over the waters. I hear the words from Genesis chapter 1. The Spirit hovered over the waters at, at the dawn of creation. The God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. And then you have over the flood. And so you have the, the flood during Noah's day. And the Lord sat enthroned over that flood. He was in control. And talking about Jesus here, he was behind the flood. And the Lord Yahweh, Jesus, is enthroned as king forever. And then there's something closer to home. There's this storm coming off of the Mediterranean Sea, coming over the land of Israel. And it's going to have torrential rains. It's going to cause the wadis to flood. And the mighty waters was understood was a, a Hebrew idiom for the Mediterranean. So we have these layers of poetic meaning here, all pointing to the sovereignty of God that he rules. He rules nature. He rules everything. He is king over the waters. He is king over the floods. He is king over creation at the very dawn of creation. He is king of the flood that destroyed all but eight people on the planet. And he is king over the storms that roll off the Mediterranean in Israel's day. And he is king over the storms in our life. Whatever they are, come what be, come what may, he is sovereign. He is in control. And we have nothing to fear in the sense of the fear of punishment. There is reverential fear. Man in a thunderstorm, I, I, if you're outside, and you, I know one time we were, where were we? I think we were at a rest stop when a thunderstorm rolled in and we quickly got back in the car and waited it out before we got back on the freeway because it was pouring so heavenly or so heavily. And then we move on in the chiasmus to the C, C1 and C2. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. And then C2, and in his temple, all cry glory. And so when it's speaking of the voice of the Lord here, it's speaking of the voice of this Mediterranean thunderstorm rolling in off the Mediterranean, thundering and lightning and shaking the mountains. The voice of the Lord is powerful. It's not saying that that storm is literally his voice, but he is the God of the storm. And so it's likening his voice to this storm. The Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. And as a result, all of us in the temple all cry, glory. It's a response of praise and a response of hallelujah. A response of recognizing the, the sheer power of Yahweh and our recognizing the sheer power of Jesus. We don't always think of I can think of Yahweh as being powerful like a thunderstorm. But we don't always, often think of Jesus as a powerful thunderstorm, do we? Something to ponder. I love those words, the voice of the Lord is majestic. In our cities, we have robbed ourselves of the majesty of creation. We have the majesty of man's creation, buildings and houses and skyscrapers and cityscapes and night skylines. But we've robbed ourselves of the majestic of creation itself. A friend of mine, Joni Engeman Tomlin, posted a picture. She's a fantastic wildlife photographer. She actually is a scuba diver and photographs undersea creatures down in Florida and she and her husband travel all over the world for uh, photographing animals and scenes and so on and this last week she posted a picture of the Milky Way in some lonely spot where there was no light pollution 
and it just took away my breath. So beautiful. But here again, it's not just talking about creation. It's talking about the storms of creation, the hurricanes, the typhoons, the tornadoes, the thunderstorms. Moving on to D1 and D2. We see the voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. And then down below, the Lord, the voice of the Lord twists the oaks. You see the, com the comparison then, cedars with oaks and cedars of Lebanon with forest uh, stripped bare. The cedars of Lebanon were renowned. I think it was Solomon who got a lot of that lumber for building the temple. That cedar lumber, that beautiful wood that comes from cedars. My dad had cedars all over. My dad and mom had cedars all over their property. And they had cedar stumps that had been left over. And so he would take a chainsaw and hew fence posts out of those stumps. And they were old growth, so they would last forever. That wood was still good, having been cut down in the 40s. And this was in the, the mid-90s. 50 years later, that, that wood was just as good that, as the day it was cut down. But these were huge, majestic tree, trees that were in the heights of Lebanon, north of Israel. They were old growth trees, enormous trees. And what this is getting at is those Mediterranean storms coming in, those huge thunderstorms, could break the cedars, could split them in half, just as we saw that tree in the campground at Lake Wenatchee cut. And another tree we saw split. The Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. The power of that, the power of a thunderstorm that can even strip a tree or break a tree. The voice of the Lord twists the oaks. It's one of the hardest woods. I love working with oak. It's, as a woodworker, it's one of my favorite woods. Of course, I like rosewood too and black walnut, but they're even harder to work with. But oak is a beautiful wood, very, very hard. And for a thunderstorm to be able to twist an oak, and then it strips the forest bare, it takes all the leaves, the, the high winds of a thunderstorm come through and strip the trees of their leaves and sometimes even of their branches. We know what it's like after a great storm here. All of the freeways and roads are covered with branches from the pine trees and from the fir trees, from the cedars. And again, get this, the voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. And so throughout this psalm, he's talking about the voice of the Lord. God speaks, and there is great power when he speaks, likening it to this thunderstorm. And then we move on and we get to the center, the last A pair of lines of poetry, E1 and E2. And it says, He makes Lebanon leap like a calf, Syrian like a young wild ox. And then skipping down to E2, The voice of the Lord shakes the desert. The Lord shakes the de desert of Kadesh. And so Lebanon was to the north of Israel, and it was above Israel. So you look down on Israel from the heights of Lebanon. And it makes those mountains of Lebanon leap like a calf, bounce up and down like a calf coming out of a stall, all joyful and prancing and dancing. The storm, it wasn't an earthquake. It's that the storm itself, the thunder and the lightning and the power of the wind was making the, the mountains jump. It seemed like it anyway. And then Syrian, which is the Syrian name for Mount Hermon, which is in the heights of Lebanon, a little bit to the northeast. And it makes Syrian leap like a young wild ox. What power that would make the mountains bounce, dance. And then you have E2, the voice of the Lord shakes the desert. So the desert just goes on east of Israel forever out onto the Saudi Arabian Peninsula, huge deserts, 
and it shakes the desert, this storm rolling over. And it shakes, the, the Lord shakes the desert of Kadesh. The region of Kadesh, if you look on a Bible map in Jesus' day, or in David's day actually here, and you look to the south, Kadesh was about 50 miles southwest or south of Beersheba, near the very southern border of Israel. And it shakes the desert of Kadesh. So all through this psalm, you have the power of God's thunderstorm, the power of God. So they're poetically using the thunderstorm as a metaphor, as an image, likening it to God and to his voice. And then we come to the centerpiece. And it's a rather strange centerpiece. The voice of the Lord strikes with flashes of lightning. Hmm. The voice of the Lord strikes with flashes of lightning. I think it's, first of all, getting at his incredible power. A bolt of lightning, I don't remember how many volt, volts of electricity has in it, but it's an enormous amount of electricity in one bolt of lightning. We were out at Lake Wenatchee, no, at, actually at um, Elbow Lake, no, Horseshoe Lake. It was Horseshoe Lake out at Bet Betty Kubley's place for a 4th of July picnic, and a thunderstorm rolled in over the lake. And immediately it started a downpour, and so everybody had gone in the house. We had two, Betty had set up, and we had helped her to set up two large of those, what are they called, canopies, very large canopies over the lawn. So people were huddled, huddled, huddled under there, but once the lightning started, everybody ran in the house, and I was making sure everybody was safe. Kathy Moore was outside just coming out of the restroom. I was right on the corner of her little cabin there, not, not her house, but she had a little cabin right across the sidewalk. And just as I came around the corner, a bolt of lightning struck the playground about 20 feet from me and about 10 feet from Kathy. And I could feel the electricity in my hair. And it struck the rocks and it just, and immediately this deafening boom. And Kathy went, and I went, let's get inside. We're used to that still, small voice of the Lord. We're used to that voice of Jesus saying, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. We like to hear that voice. I've heard his voice speaking to me for 36 years, continually beckoning me for me to draw closer and closer, continuing you to come closer and closer and to take on the yoke of his grace. But there are times when the voice of the Lord strikes with flashes of lightning, with great power, and it might even infer judgment times which remind us of our reverential fear of God, that he is awesome power. remember being in a service with Greg Oliver, our pastor down at Grace Community Covenant Church, and we were sitting in a morning service and a thunderstorm had rolled over. And at one point, I've never had this happen to me, wish it would, but that's just ego. At one point in a sermon, Greg said something like, the mighty power of God, and right then a lightning bolt struck right outside the building. Thunder immediately hit the building. The whole building shook, and we all went, ooh, Greg. I don't know if Randy and Terry, if you remember that, if you were there that day, but it was, I was in college, and it was an incredible moment when God <laughs> became Greg's sermon example. Where is he speaking in our life right now? With thunder and flashes of lightning. Where is he speaking in our world today? Where is Jesus speaking in our world today? With flashes of lightning. 
in the worldwide and nearly universal sex trade that's in every country, in the harsh treatment of the poor, in the incredible racism that's still with us around the world and in our country. in the killing of 66 million babies in our country and over 1 billion worldwide. In the pride of those of us in churches who look down our nose at people who are yet to come to know you, yet to come to know the Lord. Where is the voice of the Lord, the voice of Jesus, striking with flashes of lightning in your life today? Or is he? Maybe this isn't that time. Sometimes it's not judgment. A lot of times it's not judgment. It's just to remind us of his incredible power. of his incredible power in creation and that he sits as king sovereign over all storms. He sits as king sovereign over the storm of this pandemic. He sits as king sovereign over all those other storms in our life. He sits as king sovereign over our poverty. He sits as king, sovereign over my cancer. He sits as king, sovereign over liver disease. He sits as king, sovereign over COPD and diabetes and obesity. The voice of the Lord strikes with flashes of lightning. Ponder this today. Kind of hard to ponder it here because it's a beautiful day. But come Saturday, maybe I'll get a taste of this. What the psalm is getting at is that God is powerful. That the Lord, Yahweh, is powerful. In ways that leave us speechless. That leave us in awestruck reverential fear. May we be given this vision of who God is in the splendor of his holiness, in his glory and strength. And then I want to just point out a couple other things about this psalm that you probably noticed. Here we have the voice of the Lord. This is why it's called the Canticle of the Seven Thunders, which is picked up in Revelation. I'll leave you to do some homework on that one, but... Notice B1, the voice of the Lord is over the waters. And we have two, the voice of the Lord is powerful. Three, the voice of the Lord is majestic. Four, the voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Five, the voice of the Lord strikes with flashes of lightning. Six, the voice of the Lord shakes the desert. Seven, the voice of the Lord twists the oaks and strips the forest bare. And so you have this continual allusion to the voice of the Lord, the voice of the Lord. And it's seven times, which is, we know, the number of perfection within Hebrew understanding. It meant something to them, that the voice of the Lord is perfect. When he speaks, his word never returns void. What word are you need, needing to hear in your life? Maybe it's simply Jesus' words, peace be still. And look at every one of those. It's all about his power, his sheer power. And we're talking not only about the Lord, Yahweh, but we're talking about Jesus. The voice of Jesus is over the waters. The voice of Jesus is powerful. The voice of Jesus breaks the cedars. The voice of Jesus strikes with flashes of lightning. 
The voice of Jesus shakes the desert. The voice of Jesus twists the oaks and strips the forest bare. And then there's another thing about this psalm you'll notice. You notice the occurrence of Lord, of Yahweh, which we know in our case is Jesus the great I am. And if I count them up, there's 18 Lords in this. C2 doesn't have Lord, but actually that belongs to the verse that is D2. And so this is a psalm, the Canticle of the Seven Thought Thunders, is a song about Yahweh. And because of our further enlightenment, because of the New Testament, we know that this is a psalm about Jesus and his power, the splendor of his holiness, the glory due his name. It's a psalm all about his glory and strength that he sat enthroned over creation that he sat enthroned over the flood, which is a warning to us. And he is enthroned as king forever. Every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he is God, that he is king. And then lastly, one more thing I'll, I'll point out to you. You'll notice in the voice of the Lord is over the waters, the glory, or the God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. We know that mighty waters is a Hebrew, Hebrew idiom about the Mediterranean Sea. So we have on the west, this storm is coming from the west over the Mediterranean. And then if you skip down, he makes Lebanon leap like a, a calf. Well, Lebanon, the heights of Lebanon, are to the north of Israel, looking down on Israel. And so the storm is so big coming off the Sea of, or the Mediterranean Sea to the west, that it, in it covers over the heights of Lebanon to the north. And then you'll see lower down, the voice of the Lord shakes the desert. Well, that conveys the wilderness, which was to the east of the Jordan River, that whole wilderness that went into the great deserts. And so you have the storm. If it's coming in from the west, it's already covered all over the north, and now it's covered all the way into the desert. It's all over the land of Israel. And then you have the Lord shakes the desert of Kadesh, and that desert is in the very south, actually to the south of Israel, so you have the Mediterranean Sea beyond the borders of Israel, Lebanon beyond the borders of Israel to the north, the desert, the great wilderness beyond the borders of Israel to the east, and then the desert of Kadesh beyond the borders of Israel to the south. And so when this storm comes in, it covers over all of Israel. And in our lives, these storms cover the entire people of God, the Jewish people first who have come to believe, and then we who have been grafted into that one true vine, that one true man. God makes a brand new person, Ephesians chapter 2, Romans chapter 9. What it's getting at is this, this powerful storm isn't just a storm that destroys, it's the majesty of his power is over every aspect of our life. The majesty of his power and the glory and strength of his power is over this pandemic and over every part of our life right now. Over every Christian. Over every person grafted into the true vine. And I would say with this storm, it's over the whole world. And if it's teaching us every, anything, it's that the Lord is king forever. That he sits enthroned over the flood.
lot to ponder. There's so much woven into this psalm. But again, the voice of the Lord strikes with flashes of lightning. Oh, give us ears to hear your voice, Lord. Oh, give the world ears to hear your voice, Lord. Oh, give President Trump and former President Obama and Mitch McConnell and Nancy Pelosi and former Vice President Biden. I pray that you would give all of these people, all of the Senate, all of the Congress, our governors, our state representatives, our House representatives, that you would give all of us ears to hear the voice of the Lord striking with flashes of lightning in our midst. And you would return to us that reverential fear, Lord. And so th there you have the psalm, the chiasmus, the explanation. Now let me read through it one more time. Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon leap like a calf, Syrian like a wild ox. The voice of the Lord strikes with flashes of lightning. The voice of the Lord shakes the desert. The Lord shakes the desert of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord twists the oaks and strips the forest bare. And in his temple, we all cry, glory, glory. And the Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord is enthroned as king forever. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. The Lord gives strength to his people. Jesus gives strength to his people. Jesus blessed his, blesses his people with peace. Amen. Well, there you have it, Psalm 29. I really enjoyed preparing this one. It's become one of my favorite psalms. Just the beauty of a thunderstorm and likening that to God to God's voice and to the voice of Jesus, thundering sovereignty and hope in our life, that he is in control, even in, over the worst storms in our life. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that your voice resounds from the heavens. Sometimes in the stillness of when there is no wind and no earthquakes and no fire. But sometimes in the mighty thunderstorms that roll in, the mighty thunderstorms in our life of illness and financial collapse and hunger and poverty and broken relationships and the brokenness and consequences of our own sin and the storm of this pandemic. We thank you that you still sit enthroned in heaven, that you are ruler over all creation, that you sit enthroned over the waters, that you sit enthroned even over this pandemic. We know you're allowing it, Lord. We know that we grow the deepest. We receive the deepest blessings in the hardest of times. So thank you for blessing us, Lord. Thank you for the fearsome and awesome work that you are doing in our lives right now through the storms of our lives. Thank you that we are all in the school of trust, all in the school of faith. And sometimes when heaven is silent, 
You're just asking us to trust you. Well, at all times. Every moment, every trouble, every storm is an opportunity given by you to learn to trust you a little more or maybe a whole lot more. Give us the to, ears to hear. Give us ears to hear the voice of the Lord. Striking in flashes of lightning in our life. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, thanks for joining me today. I'll be back tomorrow at noon with Psalm 30. And then again this Sunday, we are going to continue our look at the, at the event of the good woman of Samaria, the woman at the well with her encounter with Jesus. I love the story. It's a wonderful story. We come up upon a very rich part of that, that story. The whole thing is rich. So that will be at 11 a.m. on on Sunday. On Saturday at 3.30 p.m., my wife is leading a Bible study on Acts. So if you want to join that, please contact us. You have multiple ways that you can contact us. Bible study tomorrow night at 7 p.m. on the Discipleship of Grace. I've looked at discipleship materials and they are notoriously legalistic. So I thought, well, let's come up with our own. So this group at church of about 15 to 20 dearly beloved friends are helping me to craft this multiple unit Bible study. We're on unit three called The Descent of Man and on a chapter entitled From Adam to the Twelve Brothers. That's tomorrow night at seven. I'll have the documentation out today for that. Uh, Again, thank you for joining me. Our blessing today is found in Revelation chapter 5, verses 11 through 14. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is a lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and all and on the sea and all things in them. I heard saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. And we too fall down and worship, saying, Glory. Glory. Amen.